Now the construction of this case is such that it goes together with four screws. There's two on this plate and two on the plate on the bottom. I've removed those screws and I've removed these end plates. And now this just slides out, which is quite nice. This little bit falls off, it slides out. And there is the actual circuit board containing all the gizmos that make a UHF transmitter work. And it's a single sided load. That means there's only components on one side. Let's have a closer look at it and see what we can pick up. So here we have the transmitter board for the uh, Shearer UHF system. And let's take a close look at what's on the board. Now, uh, down this end here, we've got the radio connection jack for the antenna, we've got a bind button and we've got a status LED, that's pretty straightforward stuff. Up the other end we've got the power input and the PPM connection which goes off to your transmitter and on the board itself, now this obviously is the long range 7.02 um, Thomas Shearer long range system and on the board we've got some interesting bits and pieces. First of all down here, uh, where is it, we've got our little 8-bit microcontroller here which does all the digital stuff converting the PPM signal into uh, a kind of format stream of data that will go into this little chip down here. Now this chip here is the Micrel 506 and it's, it's not an uncommon chip in this kind of application. What it does is it has built an oscillator. It's actually a, a transceiver chip. It is also a receiver, a transmitter and a receiver. It generates the necessary frequencies and encodes them with the digital signal from your transmitter and it then passes it on to this chip here. Now this is the power amplifier and this particular one is a Skywork, I think it is. Um, it's a, up to 2.8 watts of output. So this system can put output about 2.8 watts if you really push it hard. And one thing that's interesting to note is down here we've got a, a little thing marked high and low power and it comes strapped here for low power. So out of the box it runs at a, or a power level that probably is legal in most countries. But clearly if you were to run three wires off here to a, to a toggle switch so you could switch backwards and forwards you could go to high power and that would obviously then utilize the, perhaps the full power of this linear amplifier here which will produce up to 2.8 watts of output power. One thing to note though, one th very very important thing to note, if you were going to um, implement a switch here to increase the power, you'll notice on the back here there is a, an area on the circuit board which is marked out and it says, what does it say, I can't read it from this angle, something about um, cooling area if high power version. So obviously you've got to put a heat sink on here and why do you need to put a heat sink on here? Well if we go back to the other side, um, there are two major devices along that portion where the heatsink would sit. You've got your linear power amplifier which gives you your radio frequency signal and here you've got your switched mode regulator. Now this takes the battery voltage which can be I think anywhere from 6 to 26 volts and converts it into the much much lower I think about 3.6 volts that these other components need. So uh, this is going to dissipate a bit of power. These devices are only about, mm, I looked at the spec sheet and it said 42% efficient. So if you're going to be putting out 2.8 watts of power you're going to be turning around about 3 watts of power, over 3 watts of power into heat. That heat has to go somewhere. If you do not put a heat sink on the back there then this is going to get too hot and it will fail and it'll be your own fault. So that's something to look at. Now we've got some fairly, um, the rest of the board's pretty straightforward, there's no real issues there I see. You know it's, it's fairly well designed, it's a very sparse layout, it's not cramped in any way shape or form, the soldering is of good quality. My only, the thing I dislike about this is it's got a black solder mask, that's the the covering over the copper so it's very hard to see where the traces go and oh, I don't know it's just a personal thing I don't like black solder mask because it makes it harder to see the quality of layout whether it's been routed carefully properly or whether it's been done by a computer with an auto router which usually ends up with a pretty poor job but anyway that's a small thing now important stuff from the point of view of UHF flying is how clean is the output on this transmitter and we're going to look at that when I put it on the bench and, and run the spectrum analyzer but we can tell a lot from the construction we can tell I've looked at this chip here it's got reasonably good specs these two chips in, in concert they're pretty clean chips if you use them properly and coming out of this linear amplifier we can see the traces flow along here and they go into here a double pi circuit. Now that's just basically what that means is there's some coils and some, in, and some capacitors and it filters out all the, um, well not all of them but a great deal of the unwanted harmonics and so forth that might be generated inside that chip. So it's going to give you a pretty clean output. These coils and capacitors are also often used to provide better matching to the antenna which is 50 ohms and so this, this looks pretty clean, it looks pretty good. I am quite happy with that. I think this will perform reasonably well when we throw it on the bench and 
check it for a spurious output. So it looks like it's going to have a pretty clean output, and that's really important because you're running UHF 433, and you're probably going to be running 1.2 or 900, 1.2 or 1.3 gigahertz video. So if this is going to spew out harmonics onto your video signal, you're not going to have a good day. You're, you're going to have, you may have wonderful long range for your radio link, but your video is going to be crap. And that's something we're going to look at very closely in future videos. So that's the transmitter. I would give that, you know, a pretty high score. It's been pretty well designed. Layout's good. Components seem to be a good choice for the job. And the fact that you can bump it up to high power, which will probably be illegal in many places, but if you want to do it, you can do it. I won't recommend that you do it because I reckon you should follow the rules. Yes, I said that. Rightio, there you go. That's the transmitter. Now let's have a look at the receiver. Here's the receiver. It comes with the, uh, it looks like a captan coating. That's kind of a, an insulating coating. It's a heat shrink, but it's yellow, and captan is this color. I don't think it's captan. The reason captan is used is it's got a very good fire resistance. It's very good at high temperatures. You don't need that on here. At least I would hope you wouldn't. But it's pretty similar to the transmitter in so much it uses the same Micro 506 here, which is that transceiver I mentioned. So it's, it's using the receiver part of that chip. The transceiver is a transmitter and a receiver. This time it's using the receiver side. Um, I've linked the data sheets for these chips in down below. If you're a techo person like myself and you want to have a look at the specs for these chips, then I've put the data sheets or a link to them in the description of this video. So you can go and have a look for yourself and see what the technical specs are. But in a nutshell, it's it's not a bad chip. It has a sensitivity that means it can it can hear signals anywhere from minus 97 to minus 113 decibels what that means is it can pick up very faint signals now the sensitivity depends on something called the data rate which basically means the slower you send information then the more sensitive the receiver is. it's a bit like that mission to pluto it's so far away now that they're sending data at an incredibly low rate because they can it makes the whole thing more sensitive and get more um, range out of a given amount of power if you use lower data rates, right? Um, that's just a little bit of information for you. There's your 8-bit processor to do all your, because uh, we're working backwards this time. Of course, we've got the radio frequency stuff comes in through here, goes into this transceiver chip, then it spits out into the microcontroller, which then breaks it up into the various channels, and also does the other stuff like binding and, and um, fail safe and, and presenting the RSSI and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, it does a bit of work down there. That's not too much of a problem. Um, from a power supply perspective, um, it's, uh, yeah, um, it's, it's interesting actually. Um, it's got a number of uh, small devices down here. There's, there's a regulator on there. Not a lot of capacitance in there, but these are pretty low drain devices. They don't draw a lot of current, so you shouldn't need a lot of capacitance. One thing that I will be testing, of course, is I know that there have been other reviews of, of these receivers, and uh, I know I'd be crazy, said he had some problems. I'm gonna put on the bench and see if those problems still exist where they apply to this receiver or the other receiver I'll be looking at in a moment, which is the longer range one. But for normal range, you only get a standard piece of wire for your antenna. You can see this provision here for an SMA or an RPSMA connector. So if you really wanted to, you could peel back the heat shrink and unsolder that, solder in an SMA connector and use a screw-on antenna if you wanted to. But this, this is really designed for a little, sort of like um, moderate range, not for ultra long range, it's just for moderate range. So this piece of an wire antenna here is probably going to be all you need for a small model or a quad or something like that. On the other side here, we've got... Um, turn around so I can see. We've got information legends for all the bits and pieces. Um, not a lot of um, stuff to really see. There's no components on the side. It is what we call a single-sided load. So all the components fit on the other side, which is quite good. It's a very thin, look at that. It's a very, very thin, but it is, it is quite sizable. It's quite a large receiver. You know, there's my hand. It is quite a big receiver for what it is, um, but it is quite light. I shall throw it on the scales and measure it in a moment. Um, and, but now we'll have a look at the other receiver that came in the pack. And here it is, and it's a beast, it's huge, it's, it's very large indeed. Um, not an issue if you're going very long range. Long range UHF uh, uh, models tend to be quite large. You're not going to fly your little AXN out to 30, 40, 50 kilometres away. You're going to have a fairly large plane because you need big batteries and you need a big wing to give you efficiency. So the size of this probably isn't going to be too much of an issue. It is a two-stack design. You see there's two boards here. It has diversity. See, we've got two antenna connectors there. Um, so we can run multiple antennas and obviously run them uh, quite a long spacing to get the best effect and a long way from your video gear or anything like that. Um, it has this massive capacitor on the side, 2200 microfarads at 25 volts. This is obviously to stop brownouts, and I think that's what IB Crazy was talking about. There was a, a brownout potential in these receivers, which I will be testing very carefully on the bench. Um, from a physical construction side of things, well, it's as I say, it's a stacked deck. It's got heat shrink around it. It's, um, eh, you know, uh, there's no case, but again, it's probably not such an issue. You're going to be mounting it inside a model. It's going to be a protection, probably going to be a foam model, or it's going to have enough room to actually mount this. Um, I probably would have liked to have seen a case, and this capacitor on the side is, is you know, it's, it's a good thing to have, but 
you know, um, we'll check and see whether it's there because there are some other problems it's trying to mitigate or whether it's just something they decided to stick in and see how it went. So what I'll also do, of course, is I will split the heat shrink off and we'll have a look inside at the boards because this is, have a look at the electronics. So let's pull it apart, you know, and see what's inside. Okay, so this is the RF deck. This is where all the receiver goodness lives. And you can see it's quite a bit different to the normal range receiver. There's a lot more in here, a lot more guts in the radio frequency side of things. We've got our, our two antennas, better point with something. We've got our two antenna connectors here. These seem to come through. These look like low noise pre-amplifiers, which will boost the signal before it comes through to, there's our Micro 506, the same transceiver chip. But there's a lot going on between the antennas and that chip. So there's a lot of pre-amplification going on that will increase the sensitivity quite markedly and uh, so yeah this is definitely going to give you a lot longer range it should give an excellent range actually with this front end RF amplification um, the only thing we've got to look at is how well the front end is designed because when you amplify a signal coming in from an antenna you amplify everything and so if you've got some really strong signals on adjacent channels nearby frequencies it can cause the receiver chip itself to get overloaded because it's being clobbered with very high levels so I'd expect to see some tuning some some filters designed to filter out unwanted frequencies between these antenna jacks and the preamps and between the preamps and the transceiver chip. So I'm going to have a closer look and see what I can find. And yes, indeed, there is a lot of filtering on the front end. That's brilliant. Now, if I just try and I'm holding this by hand, so excuse me if it's all a bit cockeyed, but we've got some, some inductors here. See, L is the symbol for inductor. So we've got a couple of inductors capacitors. So we've created a, there's a tune circuit on the front end here, which will filter out those unwanted frequencies. And, and then there's our little... Um, pre-amplifier. I think I haven't looked up the bit on that. I'm just guessing. I'm pretty safe get, but guess though that this is a pre-amplifier. Here, this is probably going to be switching. Um, I'm not sure whether the chip itself, I should look at the data sheet, whether it has diversity built into it. I don't think it does, in which case this will be the diversity handling bits up the front here, switching between the antennas to get the strongest signal as required. So there you go. Yeah, I mean, and again, ah, this has got a black solder mask. Pfft, it's a personal thing. I don't like it, but hey, you know, um, it works. Got these really reasonably good quality connectors here for the for the pin so that this board is a, a daughter board. It plugs into the other board, which is the logic board. And not a lot to complain about. There's the filtering on the other antenna. You can see it, it's pretty well designed, pretty well laid out. I'm, I'm pretty happy with this actually. This is um, this is not a bad looking bit of kit. So let's take a look at the other board now. That's the logic board where all the digital goodness happens. Okay, on our logic board, we've got the pretty standard 80 mega 8-bit AVR processor in here. This does all your digital thing, takes your signal from your receiver and turns it into the different channel outputs and the RSSI signals and that sort of stuff. So that's, that's pretty standard fare. The design, it's a pretty sparse board because there's not a lot to do digitally. I mean, you know, the, everything's done inside this little chip here. So yeah, it's all right. Pretty sparse. They could have actually made this a snot load smaller if they wanted to, but I guess they figured you don't need to because your space isn't at a premium in most large long range FPV models. So it's probably better to have it sparsely laid out. It makes it easier to fault find, easier to design. And uh, you know, there's no real downsides. Now, the big capacitor I was talking about, you can see it has actually been soldered across these servo leads now. You've got your uh, negative, your positive, and this is where all the signals go along this row. So it's basically right across the output to the servos, which is also where the receiver gets its own power from. And yeah, we'll see what it does, see whether it's important. I mean, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, I would tend to run a long range system. I would actually, I wouldn't want to run the receiver from the same bus as my servos. I'd like to run a separate UBEC, to be honest, so that my receiver power supply is completely separate to my servos. So that a servo isn't going to bring down this rail. Um, it's a choice, but I mean, it would be a nice option, I think, to include in here. Maybe they do. I haven't actually read the instructions yet, so we'll find out. But there you go. It's got the little sticker on here so you can scan that with your smartphone and um, go to the site for documentation, I presume. But there you go. So, yep, that is not a bad bit of kit. And as I say, this this um, daughter board just plugs in. You can see the connectors, um, the plugs line up, and a little socket and plugs, plugs in, and away you go. Now, um, I'm always a bit dodgy about having things that plug together in a... Uh, environment that flies because whenever you have connections you have the potential for connection failure. Now daughter board setups and this had heat shrink around it to hold it in place. These are a reasonable quality sort of a connector. It's not gold. Is it gold? I have to have a look. Hold Excuse me while I take it out of frame. I didn't actually check. Yes it's gold plated so that's good. Focus camera. Come on. Yep. It's gold plated so there shouldn't be an issue. That's pretty good. Um, reliability should be not an issue but if people use cheap connectors just the tin plated ones oh, all sorts of problems happen so thumbs up to Shira they've done a good job they've produced a receiver which is um, looks like it's going to perform really really well and it also looks not just sensitivity and range but that filtering on the front end it should have some pretty good um, performance when we 
put it out there and can try and accost it with really big signals that are out of band. So that's pretty good. And what I'll do is I'll zoom out here now because you want to, I want to give you an, uh, an indication of the actual size of this receiver because as I say, it's not a small receiver. Here is my hand, so I might as well leave that board off, but here's my hand and there's the receiver. It is quite large as you can see um, to give you an idea of what's going on. Here is the normal range, I'll do a comparison. There's the normal range receiver. It is smaller and certainly it is a lot thinner because that's a single deck and this is a double deck. We've got the other board goes on top. So there you go. Those are the technical bits. That's the hardware look at the Shearer system and I'd have to say it's the first one I've done here, so it's going to be the benchmark, it's going to be the reference point, but I'd say it, it's, it is really well done. I have very little to complain about in terms of the design and physical construction of the Thomas Shearer Long Range System.